we're going to formally begin. So um, thank you all for coming um, today on this snowy morning here in the Northeast. Uh, my name is Jen McCann, and I'm with the uh, University of Rhode Island Coastal Research Center and Rhode Island Sea Grant. And um, the title of today's um, presentation is Understanding Multi-Use, a Social Ecological Approach to Development of Integrated Offshore Food, Wind, Energy Systems. And um, hey, Serrano, good to see you. Um, now I can say this is an international event, present webinar, thanks to Serrano from Brazil. So um, um, as many of you know, here at NORI, our team has been working on ocean planning, whether we're talking about ocean planning in Narragansett Bay um, in the Northeast or beyond that. And so um, as, as many of you have engaged and participated in, in conversation about coexistence and how can we do it better in the Northeast? And what are some actions that we can take to really um, uh, move that agenda forward? Um, for the purpose of this conversation, um, multi-use or again, coexistence is defined as the intentional joint use of resources in a close geographic proximity. Um, multi-use is conceived as a more integrated and efficient approach to marine spatial management aiming at creating synergies between marine uses and achieving economies of scale to unlock blue growth, encouraging new forms of collaborations between marine users to reduce conflicts over space and resources and freeing up space from human pressures to contribute to biodiversity and sustainability. And I'll put that in the chat room, just um, so that is our definition of, of multi-use. Um, uh, today, we have um, Dr. Barry Costa Pierce, who um, is a, a I, I won't use the word old. We've known Barry for a very long time. Barry was the director of Rhode Island Sea Grant and um, played a leadership role um, with our ocean spatial plan, uh, ocean uh, stamp here in Rhode Island, looking at future ways of ocean planning and, and activities that could um, take place here off of our coast in Rhode Island. Um, Barry is currently a professor in the Faculty of Biosciences and Aquaculture at Nord University in Norway uh, and CEO of the Ecological Aquaculture Fund. <laughs> and Barry has 40 years um, working in marine science research development, working from the tropics to the Arctic, as a scientist and policy expert while living long-term in Asia, the Pacific Islands, and Africa, and the Americas. And his, um, his full bio, I think, is in the Eventbrite. Um, so we love listening to Barry. We love Barry's a doer and um, has an opinion about everything, So which, which we appreciate and we need um, as we're talking about coexistence. So Barry's going to present for about 30 minutes. Um, we're going to ask you to hold your questions until after that, um, and you're welcome to put questions in the chat room or raise your hand, and um, uh, we will answer, We will uh, have a discussion, a good, thorough discussion um, uh, after Barry's presentation. Um, this is being recorded, so we'll, we'll send this out to everybody afterwards so that um, you can share it with your friends and colleagues. So, um, Barry, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks, Jen. Well, first of all, thanks to Jen for all of what she's done. She's an outstanding leader. I was honored to work with her and honored to work with her again. Uh, and Jen, thank you and your team for this opportunity today to have a discussion. Um, so, uh, first of all, can you see the slides? And I'll try to start advancing them. Is everything okay, Jen? Everything looks great. We can hear you and your slides look great. Okay, great. So as you heard, uh, I am now resident uh, in both the U.S. and in, in Norway. Uh, and in Norway, we have uh, about 25 master's students working in this uh, international Nordic master's in the sustainable production and use of marine bioresources. We go back and forth between the EU and the EAA, the European Economic Area. 
So I'm going to sort of share the international down to the local today, um, some of the, the more stunning accomplishments and you know, developments and what could happen in the future. Uh, most of this you, you might know, some of it um, hopefully uh, would be helpful to the United States and uh, particularly the Northeast in, in moving forward quickly. Okay, so this is the outline of, of my presentation. As, as you know, these words are being used everywhere. Uh, so in a perfunctory way, it's go big, go small, do everything and do it fast because of the both not only climate change, but the social changes that we're all dealing with. And this is worldwide. So it's affecting pretty much every local as well. Uh, the international scene is affecting uh, every local jurisdiction that I, 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 I uh, work with. Uh, that means we have to work in scope from locally to globally and have to keep on developing communities of, of practice and of learning uh, because Frankly, we're all in this together over the next 50 years and the next generation and building diverse and local communities is, is going to be a really big part of that. Uh, next thing is a, a bit of the planning frameworks that we've used and the scenario planning that we're using uh, in particularly for offshore in Norway, uh, how that can relate to renewable energy. And let's go right to the conclusions because uh, you need to know where I'm coming from and I'll, I'll emphasize these at the end. Uh, first of all, there should be no uh, surprise to those of you that are in Rhode Island who saw America's first offshore wind farm. Uh, it took a long time. It took about six years, uh, which is actually very quick in terms of the, the processes for the larger wind farms that we're talking about. But build this long-term learning community, uh, as I mentioned, local to global, but make it structural. Uh, we, we're going to need larger investments in people and process to get this actually done in many places. Um, and sometimes these are secondary investments that are made uh, to the capital, and but they're, they're not only as important, but maybe more important. Second of all is fund more science. Yes, fund more science, but it has to be the right kind of science that we need. So not, you know, I'm not speaking right now of you know, basic science in the National Science Foundation way or in the European Union's you know, uh, initiatives, uh, Horizon 2020. I'm talking about transdisciplinary science. And last of all, uh, if we are going to engage the next generation of leaders to build diverse and local communities, ports are quite diverse places. Um, they need a lot of help in terms of burn, b building their communities. Um, but building new port communities and breaking down maybe some of the competition, the, the, the business competition is fine. The over competition between, uh, let's just sort of say, uh, use an example between New York, New Jersey, uh, New Bedford, and maybe even Point Judith uh, needs to be sort of broken down in order for us to actually get things done quickly. Okay. So let's talk about go big and go fast, and then we'll talk about doing everything. And this is uh, what you're seeing on uh, our side of the pond, the European Union, uh, is these kinds of figures with, from the high level, level panel for the sustainable ocean economy. You know, big growth, call it 20% annual growth of offshore wind, and a floating wind, uh, an enormous amount of energy, uh, obviously in the North Sea and, and the energetic oceans off of the EU. Uh, and we all know this, uh, again, the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, further offshore because the wind power increases as a cube of the speed, uh, and more gen energetic uh, sort of wind speeds further offshore. Uh, and the floating wind is, is the key. Uh, we, we do have uh, in the state of Maine, a governor's initiative on floating wind. Uh, California has just an, announced a, a floating wind uh, development. Um, you're going to see a lot more of these kinds of innovations uh, with spar buoys, semi-submersibles. Notice on all three of these, including the tension legs, you know, anchoring systems are extremely important. And we will get to the point where some of these uh, structures are so uh, they, they become, uh, they're in such a, a severe energetic environment where we'll have to talk about decommissioning. Now, decommissioning is a, a big issue in oil and gas for, you know, at least 80 years. Um, some of the innovations in decommissioning in oil and gas 
could be brought to, to win, but that's a whole nother discussion. We could have just a complete talk about decommissioning. Okay, so uh, one of the places that I work with uh, is, it, it, I work in the EU is in the port, the extraordinary port of Bremerhaven in Germany, which is the near the home of the Alfred Wenger Institute and a pioneer who's been working in the offshore wind farms in multi-use for over 20 years, uh, Dr. Bela Buck. So Bela and I, this is actually, I'm taking a picture here. You can sort of see the level, as we all know, of the infrastructure. These are the tripiles. You know, over time, uh, when one of uh, Bela's initiative was to place some sort of food structures, as I'll, I'll show you, you know, in the midst of the tripiles, uh, they're enormous structures. But Bremerhaven really is, if you want to see the, the future of offshore wind in terms of the technological and logistical and, and shipping side, it's, a, it's a, just an incredible place to visit because you get to see the construction of the service vessels uh, and the construction vessels, as well as the construction of the towers and the turbines itself. So Siemens, this is, uh, you know, where a lot of this is going, you know, getting, again, getting big, getting big. And uh, the, the 10 megawatt machines, uh, I was in Bremerhaven about a year ago, everybody was talking about, you know, implementing eight, six to eight megawatt machines. And Siemens now has come up with, uh, you know, a, a router and a, a motor and an engine and blades uh, that are 10 megawatts. That would be about one of those, as you can see, 580 feet tall. It's on land, of course, right now, uh, being talked about moving into those tripiles offshore. That'd be about 10,000 homes for one machine. We've all seen this. If you haven't seen this, there's an annual report. This might have been two years ago. I'll, I'll talk about the last report on offshore wind. I, I always am a little bit gobsmacked by the, the amount of developments that are close to shore. Like for example, you look at the one uh, Fisherman's Atlantic City wind farm and the ones further offshore. I like to see that, it, that this is including Connecticut kind of blows me away. That might be a misprint on this, this slide, uh, but that's, that's a very ambitious plan. Uh, and you can see Maine has a quite, because of its long coast, um, it has a, a, a lot of offshore uh, renewable energy available, offshore wind, uh, but has developed very, very little of it, but has a very active research and development uh, activity. Um, down in Rhode Island, we've been talking with Orsted, Revolution, Wind, and you can see some of those, of course, the Block Island Wind Farm, uh, pioneered by the partnership of many of the people that are on this, this, this webinar. Okay, so in the last DOE report last year, um, you can see, again, go big. Uh, the Biden administration has laid out a plan by 2030. That's just almost right, right, <laughs> right in our face of 30 gigawatts. Now that's not only offshore, that's also land-based. But the states have declared, uh, if you put it together, they want at least 40 megawatts of offshore wind fairly soon. Um, so again, go fast and uh, how are we gonna do this? The logistics uh, and the vessel creation, et cetera. It's an extremely complex portfolio that requires many billions of dollars. Again, just to emphasize that on both sides of, of the Atlantic, um, there are plans. Uh, I'm part of the governor's initiative here called MIAB, uh, and you can see that report. Uh, lots of offshore wind, floating wind, in particularly in Maine, uh, which would give uh, just three percent of what's available carbon neutrality for uh, most of of Maine and the rest of New England, but uh, requires an investment of 20 billion now. I present it like this because uh, when I'm in the European Union, I see Americans and vice versa. There is a, a vast, there's a mountain of money that is being poised, a lot of European money coming to the United States and vice versa. So it, this is a uh, international to local is, is absolutely in your face when you start talking about money. Okay, so this has been talked about a lot, and I, I decided to put this slide in because a life cycle analysis of the actual construction of the of the wind turbines in the North Sea, uh, in in the German Bight, for example, 
And the German Environmental Protection Agency did con commission a complete life cycle analysis because obviously it takes a lot of carbon to manufacture in the vessels, et cetera. But you can see uh, in their analysis, the further you go offshore, the less carbon footprint you have. Uh, and the offshore wind farms achieve the lowest CO2 emissions. But the life cycle analysis was pretty stunning. And, and it's actually been confirmed for other jurisdictions throughout the world that uh, over the, the life cycle of the wind energy developments, uh, they can, the energy that is, is actually generated can recover in little as six months, all of the life cycle, all of the carbon emissions from the actual, all of the construction. So um, this has been time and I mentioned time and time again, this, this, this gets brought up, uh, but it is clear that even if you extended it out to a year or two, uh, we can recover this, uh, the carbon from that we are investing to, to construct. Okay, so do everything, go small. Um, this is uh, many of, 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 of you on this call, us as a family, everyone is talking about this. How are we gonna, how are we gonna make the change? So I wanted to talk just a bit about the ocean, uh, go small. Uh, there is all kinds of renewable energy investments in food production in the ocean. And you see small turbines, uh, you know, monitoring systems, et cetera, that don't use batteries or, or electric energy. They're sort of DC systems. And then all of this is a, a net zero house that I had the honor of spending, you know, a, a weekend at, um, this is a 2,500 square foot house with heat pumps and electric cars. Uh, their electric costs are 20 US dollars uh, a month for this, their entire sort of middle class lifestyle. So, you know, all of us are, are thinking about this. We're thinking about electric cars, fast chargers, uh, solar running heat pumps, et cetera. But when you actually live it, it's pretty stunning that we can do all of this uh, necessarily. You have to have the capital, but Governments worldwide are trying to get that to push push that capital out so into tax benefits, et cetera. So this revolution is 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 roaring throughout the world. It's down to the family level. Okay. So after that, let's talk a, a little bit about you know the planning frameworks that are being used and some of the accomplishments, particularly on the European side. We've been using just as the Coastal Resources Center and Rhode Island Sea Grant have been using this pastel matrix to actually frame up the issues that you see before you. And I'm going to break some of these down and, and talk about some of the, the real, you know, sort of societal, social, ecological challenges, as well as the business challenges that we have. Well, first of all, the economics are quite clear. We can check the box. Uh, back to the DOE report, uh, there is estimated uh, 12 billion a year that is already poised to do what the states want over the next 10 years. So back to the DOE report, I mean, this is, this is uh, no joke in, in any, any way. That, again, there's, there's enough resources here to do what the states want. Uh, on the EU side, this, this group of leaders uh, just got together and for 200 million homes they've already poised 150 gigawatts uh, ready to for, you know ready to go in the water invested uh, about 135 billion euros to do that already have the money uh, to do that um, but they are forecasting that's only half of what they want to do they want to get uh, about 800 billion euros uh, to take care of the rest of the EU now as you know um, when Germany decided, after Fukushima, the power plant, uh, you know, the tsunami in Japan, you know, Germany announced a very bold initiative to, to decommission all of its nuclear plants, which then put Bremerhaven uh, in, in the spotlight. Um, uh, of course, since the Ukraine war, uh, things have gone backwards, but please realize they've, they've not gone so backwards that this is not, you know, happening and happening quickly. Okay, so, the economics, I can check the box. Um, yeah, our dear friend, if Julia Wyman, uh, the head of Rhode Island Sea Grant Legal Program and Roger Williams School of Law, she'll know she's uh, announced to our, our group the last time we met that she's going to have a symposium about the legal challenges that we face. And we look forward to some of your discussion and participation in that. 
Okay, for over 20 years, we've been talking about the use of the area in the wind farms. And Bela, this is an early uh, rendition of which he implemented in the, in the German Bight in the North Sea. Um, as you can see, uh, quite developed uh, oyster, mussel, et cetera, food production system. But uh, to be very honest with you, uh, after I've been involved in this for over 20 years in terms of like food production from aquaculture, I'm now going to dial that back because we're going to talk mostly about fisheries here. But in terms of uh, getting sort of any food production, not only aquaculture, but fisheries in uh, 20 years ago, uh, we worked in oil and gas, both in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the Santa Barbara Channel in California. Um, and 20 years later, there was another uh, sort of book, big, thick volume, by the way, all freeware, both of these, um, and not a lot has gone on, uh, virtually nothing has gone on in terms of the use of uh, the offshore, not only uh, wind, but offshore uh, oil and gas structures for food production, with some caveats, and I'll go through some of the opportunities. The other legal challenge is because of the in in the, the the types of political system that is in your part of the world, southern uh, New England. Uh, I will never forget when we did the special area management plan uh, about the donut hole <laughs> between Block Island and federal waters back to state waters, and how the you know the the multiple jurisdictions and the multiple regulatory frameworks. Uh, striped bass, for example, is very different in federal waters. Uh, so when you look at any environmental sort of impact, you know, you're dealing with uh, the, the, the you know, revolution, deep water wind, whatever development that you're talking about, you know, you're dealing with a, a major governance, legal and regulatory challenge because you deal with multiple states, multiple structures and the feds. Okay, so I, I don't have any answers for the legal and regulatory. I can just say right now, it is one of the major constraints to a lot of developments uh, that are going on. We can talk further about that. Let's talk about the uh, production and ecological health because they are connected in my mind. This is one framework in terms of multi-use that you can, of the area, because Jen has just defined that multi-use is within the area of lease of uh, offshore renewable, or in the case, many non-renewable energy structures. We could look at the area because in both sides, many national as well as regional frameworks, they could be completely closed to any, by, by law, it can be completely closed to any uh, additional use of the area uh, for legal safety and other reasons. So we can look at it as completely closed. We could look at it as a, a biodiversity enhancement area. Or we could look at it as completely wide open. Uh, now, if you look at jurisdictions in the EU, uh, there's diversity of that. Uh, the Netherlands, for example, you cannot do offshore, you can get a permit to do offshore wind in the Netherlands if you do not allow multi-use. You must allow multi-use. You must have that dialogue. Now, I would venture to say that's a, a very bold uh, sort of, movement forward by a government that doesn't exist that to my knowledge anywhere along the east coast of, or the united states or the west coast okay so let's just dive into that a little bit we use not only the pastel we use a scenario planning framework um, i show at the top on uh, uh, fisheries enhancement i show on the bottom uh, a wide diversity not as wide as it needs to be of, of aquaculture uh, on the left-hand side, I look at, you know, uh, some diversity of bio. We can look at now what, what is really very interesting to me, talking to the Orsted people at our last meeting, is that they have quite an investment in this side. They have biodiversity officers. They have sustainability officers that are employed by the company. Uh, and this is something that you're seeing is you're seeing uh, CSOs evolve, not CTOs, not CEOs, uh, Chief Sustainability Officers, CSOs. Uh, they appear, they actually have a, a group in the EU. Uh, they meet on a regular basis. So let's look at if it was closed, 
Uh, and, and let's face it, you know, you look at the, the UK, for example, I mean, the crown owns uh, the ocean and they can decide what they want to do. And so uh, the crown has decided that they want to develop offshore wind. So it will happen. Um, so the, the legal is the major driver. Okay, so there is a lot of discussion about biodiversity and ecosystem goods and services. Uh, Heidi Alloway, uh, a dear colleague from, from Australia in the, in the Nature Conservancy put this sort of framework together. She's in this particular case, she's looking at shellfish uh, and what kind of ecosystem goods and services each one of these can be monitored, can be measured, can be monetized. You can actually monetize some of these over time. Um, let's go back to where ecosystem goods and services are really being this, the discussion is all on land. And uh, we can look at this beautiful uh, forest uh, in northern New England as the basal ecosystem that had ecosystem goods and services prior to agricultural intervention. Uh, and then we can ask this question on a landscape on one side next to Lake Champlain, we can see you know, pastures. Uh, and then, of course, on the right-hand side is a very intensive, uh, what many people say is sustainable agroecosystem or agroecology, uh, producing a, abundant amounts of food uh, with sustainable practices. But when you look at the ecosystem goods and services, you know, back to the Heidi Alloway model, uh, you can look at a number of different uh, flows uh, and monetize many of these. In the ocean, we have to look at this. Uh, this is the Horms Rev, a picture of the Horms Rev that was taken uh, from an airplane when the winds, Horms Rev is off of Copenhagen, off of, off of Denmark. And um, you can see uh, when the winds blow in a particular direction uh, fiercely from the African continent north, um, you can see that it creates tremendous amounts of, of air uh, circulation. Well, what's interesting is over time, uh, the oceanographers in Denmark, in, in uh, Sweden, et cetera, have been studying this and found that there is uh, quite an amount of artificial upwelling that occurs in these ecosystems. Because this is a, now a, a, a new ecosystem for many different ways when you talk about the marine environment. Okay, so just one more on that. I, it's just, I can get you this paper if you'd like it, Heidi Alloway's paper. Um, uh, oftentimes, we know a lot more about the provisioning and regulatory and habitat supporting services, and maybe there's not a lot of, of uh, attention as much as that needs to be uh, on cultural services and building diverse and local communities. This is again from Heidi's paper, where she looked at it, and again, she, she measured this, and I'm not going to uh, look at it, but it, in the terrestrial side, you know, we have moved from this basal ecosystem to a managed ecosystem. And this is what we're talking about in the ocean. Okay, so what gives us pause is once we get sort of beyond both the ecological health, because we can enhance biodiversity, we can then tackle and can ponder social and technological influences. Where it gets difficult is that these are what some people have called, you know, wicked problems, long-term. They have no tame engineering solutions. Now engineers, uh, I like working with engineers because they see a problem and their first way is not to design an experiment or conduct a big participatory process. They may have design charrettes, but they fix it. You know, that's what an engineer does. That's a tame solution. Uh, these issues that we're dealing with have no tame solutions. They kind of have to look at what we call scenario planning a step beyond the pesto matrix. So I'm gonna lay out three scenarios that we've been talking about for quite a long time for win-win, by turning problems into opportunities. I'm gonna talk about the first two and then spend a bit of time on food production, both fisheries and aquaculture, because that is uh, you know, a major concern uh, in, in terms of the, the nexus, you know, food, water, energy, waste, and shelter you know, that uh, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations that we're all paying attention to, you know, they, they re really do relate to the last two. But let's talk about win-win scenarios for energy operations. Uh, as you can see, there's a question whether uh, making win-win scenarios are either, they're going to be run by the wind investor themselves or integrated within their operations, 
or they're going to be separate business operations that would actually get things done to create a win-win opportunity for both. Okay, so you'll see throughout the world, most of these are, are, are either monopiles, you know, single poles, or they're jackets, or as I showed you in Bremerhaven, in the very rough North Sea, they're, jack, they're uh, tripiles. Okay, so this was the first thing when I was in, you can see this is off of Scotland. Uh, we had a meeting there. And one of the guys, uh, maybe he had a, a little bit, you know, maybe, maybe more than one pint. He said, not on me legs. You're not going to mess with me legs. Uh, that meant is that uh, there was not going to be any opportunity uh, for uh, the wind power companies in that particular jurisdiction to mess with the legs of the platforms, to tie up with anything or to put structures in the middle of the legs uh, not on me legs. Okay, so let's work through that. So what the one of the things that we've found in oil and gas, particularly in the, in the Gulf of Mexico and the Santa Barbara Channel, is that uh, upwards of three meters, you know, nine feet of mussels, uh, biofouling, can grow on the sides of the legs of these structures. Now, granted, uh, that's going to be different because some of the oil and gas legs uh, are not straight vertical. They, they move to a 45 degree angle. So there's going to be uh, different amounts of biofouling. However, uh, what we found is in some cases, it took upwards of $100,000 a month to clean off the legs of the, of the either oil and gas or the wind towers. I've been trying to find out from Orsted, I just asked them, how that is working out on Block Island. And they're gonna get back to us on that, but I can tell you that in other places, they must remove the fouling because what can happen is it sloughs off. It can go with a big thug down to the mud metal interface. Oh, it can produce acid and over time, that can erode and undermine the metal uh, of the structure itself. Uh, and decrease its lifespan. So uh, it has to be removed. Now, uh, there is actually something that happened many moons ago uh, in the Santa Barbara Channel and the oil and gas platforms there, where a particular company then used, again, this is old, fairly old technology now, but it's Venturi pumps with divers. We don't need to do divers anymore. We have much more sophisticated pumps, much more sophisticated ways of removing fouling. Uh, but you can see the muscles, and let's just look at what happened there. Now, it's hard to, to judge whether this is a fishery or uh, what is this, because there was no sort of, you know, seeding of these. Uh, this company was called Ecomar. Uh, they obtained all of the California regulatory approvals for human consumption of muscles. And you can see how much, again, this was in 1992, 1997, a long time ago. But this was a significant amount of good food. Uh, uh, the FDA came in and said there was no, obviously for human consumption, there had to be, this is an oil platform. There was no oil residues in these mussels. Uh, they weren't allowed to take from near the surface because there could have been uh, some residues floating of oil. They were not allowed to take a, a right by the, the mud water uh, metal interface because there was drilling muds that were contaminated. But as you can see, uh, this is a potential idea, a win-win on biofouling. Now, not only mussels, but there's probably other very valuable marine bioproducts that could be harvested uh, from the sides. You have to allow it to happen though. Okay, so is it a business structure? Uh, the second one, I wanted to emphasize uh, some of the innovations um, on both sides, in particularly in Canada and in, in Norway, on how we can get the, it sounds a, a bit silly because you know the, the wind power companies are going to be earning a lot of money from electricity, but how to make it a win-win scenario where they can er get additional energy income from uh, energy and fisheries uh, could then develop food systems. So this is the, the overall, I'm gonna go through each one of these. The, over, the overall uh, concept is, you know, do we really need uh, all of those cables to substations landing on shore? Um, we have made tremendous uh, advances as the, the wind power companies will tell you in the offshore grid. Uh, and so that the grid can partially 
you know, be uh, maintain electric charging stations. And all of this is either happening or uh, in a major scale developments. I'll go through all of them. Uh, what I've got here is the short sea shipping vessels. Uh, by the way, if you have long haul vessels, uh, they come to shore right now. And then short sea ship uh, vessels, you know, 40 foot roll on roll off containers, like in the port of uh, New York, uh, Los, in Los Angeles, Long Beach and Houston, is mostly short sea shipping that has most of the carbon footprint. So short sea shipping could be uh, meet the long hauls uh, being charged at the, the energy stations, electric fishing trawlers, electric work boats, electric uh, smaller boats uh, for the fishing or community base, and a completely electric submersible aquaculture station that is all uh, not only developed but being used. Okay, so this is the Norwegian prime minister. She's christening the Evoy One. I want to emphasize that this electric service vessel is again an international collaboration from, with the United States, Norway, Germany, Switzerland, and Sweden. You know, the, they did this boat again. It's lithium. They're moving hopefully beyond lithium someday. But this boat is just nothing short of spectacular in terms of a service vessel. Second of all is, uh, yes, most of the larger trawlers still use diesel and diesel is very dirty fuel. Um, so now uh, Nordbus can use a complete, uh, not sometimes completely electric, but it can at least reduce the diesel in almost half for a very large fishing vessel. There are larger fishing vessels now, this was about five years ago, Nordbus, that are completely on renewable energy being designed uh, for fishing. Now on the uh, US side, we probably are thinking right in the, your mind, the Jones Act, okay? The, you can't import these vessels. I mean, but we can make them and we can invest in them just like everyone else. Barry, you got 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, short sea shipping, right? Here's the, uh, the, the our, most of our, 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 our Land-based lines are going to be clogged uh, soon. They're getting clogged. Short sea shipping can be completely uh, uh, electric. Uh, and then just back from Canada, where Google Canada and the RBC Foundation in Nova Scotia are working on uh, uh, the, the zero emission electric lobster boat because about 75% of all of them that are in service right now are, are close to shore. And I won't mention this, but a completely integrated electric feeding platform uh, for a fish cage that can be submerged. Okay, so let's go into the, the fishing and I like to say ocean food systems, those fishing and aquaculture. How can we make a win-win? Maybe I've, uh, I could convince you the vessel innovations and uh, could be put forward, but you know, is, is win-lose, a win-lose scenarios of where we're headed, uh, particularly as we start talking about trawling. So now we're back in the open area. What can we do to improve fishing in the open area? First of all, I'd like to emphasize that we know a lot already about what the impacts of the wind farms are at very different scales all over the world. So I get this question all the time, you know, we need more research, we need more research. Well, certainly, but we at least need to make sure that we do not recreate the wheel and, and look at all of what's been done on the impacts on fishing. Uh, we did this during the SAMP. I'm not going to mention this, but I, I pulled this up from, you know, what Jen, uh, she exactly did this during the, the, the SAMP. This was the, the contract. You know, we, we brought the Europeans over. We, we ta they talked about what the impacts on fish and fisheries of different gear types were. So we, we already have this, this experience. And uh, now to emphasize from the an ecology side, whenever we put more structures out there. We know this, this is well published from 1957 even and continues. We add more niches, we add more species, we add more biodiversity in this area. So we add more complexity out there, more towers, you will get more uh, of this particular, you know. Uh, now, one of the most stunning things following again, the oil platforms in the Santa Barbara Channel which have now been there for like almost 50, 60 years. Uh, this is a stunning paper. This was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. 
Now look at this, the oil and gas platforms off the coast of California have the highest secondary fish production per unit area of seafloor of any marine habitat that has been studied. This should get our attention because we, sh we can do this. We can enhance types of fisheries in these areas if we work through everything we already know. And back in the Gulf of Mexico, if you ask the recreational fishing community, this was a big survey that was done during our time there. M most of the recreational fishermen said, absolutely, structure enhances recreational fishing. So when we talk about off offshore upwelling, if it doesn't go down as far as we need it because we need those nutrients, we have all of this knowledge. This is Aquabio. Uh, they have they studied these uh, artificial upwellings with these structures that we can put down there. We know now, you know, fisheries have been debating this. It's no longer a debate, you know, of production versus aggregation. We know that new production is occurring in some of these areas where these advances are, are being made. Now, just to emphasize, we know different types of arrangements and different types of structures for different uh, species life cycles. And then uh, the Nature Conservancy is all over restoration aquaculture. Um, and the Orsted is investing in this. Orsted announced just recently a project to grow corals on some of their offshore wind turbine foundations. We know that corals in the tropics grow quite well on all kinds of artificial structures. And we have now the Green Gravel Project to restore seaweeds. Uh, this is a, just a tremendous effort worldwide a seven US dollars per square meter of restoration, easy technologies, seeding the seaweeds on gravel, tossing the, the gravel out into the, uh, the ocean. I just put this slide as a placeholder, okay? Just to emphasize that there is a huge amount of new gear types, pot fishing innovations uh, going on. And you can see this one in, in Ireland, where the fishing representatives met uh, with the wind power people expressing great concern about the, 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 the huge development there. Uh, and pot fishing for uh, Dublin Bay prawns is now an active area of, uh, of development in that area rather than trawling. And as I mentioned, uh, you have groups now such as the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and TNC you know, involved in this portfolio. I mentioned that the sustainable development goals and number 14, uh, life below water, but that is not only um, th that. Uh, we just recently did a major review, our team uh, for, for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations on aquaculture and the SDGs uh, and what the business community said and we, uh, the scientists listened. Uh, in terms of aquaculture, Success means financial success or there's no aquaculture sustainability. Uh, they has to get, we have to get beyond the, the sort of, you know, the grant making. Okay, back to the three recommendations. I'll start to end. First of all, you already read this, build this uh, learning community, make it structural. Uh, that was what happened. What I feel strongly was the magic in Rhode Island, you know, five, six, seven years to get the towers done. Uh, led by you know, a, a, some leaders, in this case, Tracy Dalton, who's now the director of Rhode Island Sea Grant. Uh, she came up with how to measure our, a su successful participatory process. And when we looked at this, this is exactly what was the key to success, is that we had a roadmap. Of course, Jen, uh, Jen always emphasizes the participatory scenario planning, but she says in bold for action. Uh, but just to, to show you how much work that was required um, and to emphasize leadership and investment re relatively long-term, well-funded with expert extension process, well-funded, trusted long-term partnerships. And uh, can't even begin to emphasize how amazing it was to have the GIS expertise at uh, the University of Rhode Island, giving us map after map after map and spatial expertise, which is rare to see in these projects. Why, why we need to keep on talking about fisheries and aquaculture is because we need to start looking in this way. We realize that a lot of aquaculture is still in its very primitive state. 
that a lot of fisheries are moving into different ways of management. And so why we need learning communities is we, that we need to talk in this way. How can we enhance food production writ large by these mixtures of aquaculture and fisheries? By the way, these products enter a, a common marketplace anyway. So this is one of the reasons why we need to keep on talking about market-driven technologies. Science, yes, but the right kind of science, transdisciplinary science, which is characterized, as I mentioned, by wicked problems, having creative solution, stakeholder involvement, and social responsible science. That's the kind of science we need. Uh, it's what we learned during the special area management plan in Rhode Island. Uh, we didn't have for that, even that smaller area off of the coast of, of Rhode Island, Long Island and Connecticut, Massachusetts, we didn't have the, all the information. We didn't have everything in a file cabinet in order to answer that. So I just show you, this is the amount of, of, of transdisciplinary research that was put out in, in additional funds to get the special area management plan done. And we didn't know a lot of this stuff. And so that kind of science needs to be done uh, in every one of these projects. I just put this one up because this was just published. You know, how much science we look at this direct science. Painting one blade black reduced bird collisions by 70%. The contrast made the blades easier to see and to avoid. So, uh, and you can see, you know, cats, you know, uh, have just as much of a uh, impact as the towers. And last of all, the ports are our new opportunity. The port of Bremerhaven is, is nothing. Uh, is, is something to behold, to behold and how it's developed the communities around it. I, I think I've heard very clearly for some of the people experiencing uh, this, that uh, you know, this is where the way we need to go. And last of all, let's have some fun. This is going to be uh, quite a journey. And so thank you very much, URI and Jen. It's a pleasure. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Barry. That was great. Really interesting and comprehensive, I would say. So thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, if you have a question, um, you're welcome to raise your hand or, um, or add it in the, the chat. Um, Caroline Karp asked two questions. Caroline, would you like to unmute and ask one of those questions to Barry, please? Hi, Barry, good to see you again. Uh, it's been a long time. Hi, Carol. All of the development that you're talking about will occur in public trust regions where the space is a public trust space, whether it's the seafloor or the water column or the surface of the sea. Would you talk about how these ideas about um, ocean aquaculture in association with wind farms would deal with a public trust issue since it's pretty clear that this is only feasible if aquaculture focuses on high value species intended for wealthy consumers. So to what extent should public trust resources be dedicated to growing high value species for wealthy consumers and how do you create an offset for that? Yeah, well, Carolyn, I, I do wanna emphasize because maybe it's my reputation as being involved with aquaculture for many years, but uh, I, I want to emphasize that most of the opportunities that I see are, are working uh, with the fishing community and uh, with you know, biodiversity and fishing interests. I see aquaculture as um, you know, pretty far off, particularly for the, the species that you're talking about. The, you know, I would uh, venture to say that it's, we're a very, very long way, if close to never, of doing you know, sort of cages for high value species like salmon or cereola or others in the wind farm areas, you know, really anywhere in the world. And so, for example, when, when I was in the Bohai Sea off of Shanghai uh, Tianjin in China in 2019, uh, most of what they were developing there was low trophic level species that are sort of common foods. They weren't developing cages for, for fish. So, you know, but with that said, I mean, I think your larger point is, you know, how can how can these are public trust resources and how, how is society is going to work it out to allow multi-use of so the, the innovations that I mentioned in fishing that you know, where we can create upwellings if necessary because of the, the nutrients only being at the bottom. And we can do, I think primarily the priority is low trophic level species. But um, 
your expert more on the legal side, there's going to need to be a, a, a regulatory process that uh, is, it needs to be birthed to allow, for example, innovations in pot fishing that are happening there in Rhode Island, Canada, and uh, on the other side of the pond. Um, and so creating that regulatory process uh, to, to have new gear types, um, I think is, is, is going to be quite uh, a priority. Barry, can you give an example of what you mean by low trophic level critters? Well, Again, I wanted to talk about market-driven technology development, you know, being in, in the business community now. So uh, we, we have to have a market for what people demand. Um, we can't do like we did years ago, you know, come up with a great new technology for a new species and then spend years and years of working for markets. So like, for example, in, uh, as we know, in New England and the Pacific Northwest, among other places, you know, they're shellfish are very dear. The markets are large. Uh, the demand is unmet. It's mostly met, being met by, you know, imports, replacing imports. So, you know, almost all of the bivalves, you know, that are possible are, are on the table for, for development, I believe. Um, they all can be done uh, in highly energetic areas. Uh, there is no science that's needed there. It's just technology transfer. Uh, everybody's going to want me to sort of say seaweeds. I'll say seaweeds. Um, but the kinds of seaweed systems that survive, the first of all, most of them in the temperate zone are seasonal. The ones that survive in highly energetic conditions still need more engineering development. We're all working on them. Uh, but that's a storehouse of potential biopharmaceuticals and food substances, which has huge, great potential for human health and wellness. Um, I could also mention uh, some of the species that could be enhanced, such as sea cucumbers, which have a huge economic potential in Asian communities throughout North America, as well as export. Um, there's a whole cacophony of, of yeah. you know, the green environment is, I think we need to sort of think beyond the fin fish right now. We need to sort of look at these other species with greater potential. Great. Thank you. Um, so I see Greg and then Dave Monty has a question. So Greg, could you ask your question, please? And um, introduce yourself to Greg, please. Hi, hi. Um, Barry, I met you the other day at one of the other events that oh. Sea Grant and CRC hosted. So it's a pleasure. I represent the uh, Rhode Island saltwater anglers. And I guess my question, Barry, is so just about every slide I see, and it seems like most of the studies that talk about the structures increasing um, biodiversity and sea life seem to always show jacketed structures. And yet most of the turbines that are proposed here off New England and certainly off Rhode Island are proposed to be monopoles. Can you percentage wise or, or how does that, obviously it would seem to us that it's going to be a little less attractive um, to fish and things it, with a monopole compared to the jacketed, but I've never seen any studies. Like it seems like they always kind of use the jacketed study, the jacketed situ, you know, bases as the kind of the study stuff that gets cited. Can between the two, do you see much of a difference, or you know, why is it that they always kind of show the jacketed things if that's really not what we're going to be exposed to here? Yeah, very good question, Greg. More structure, more habitat, more biodiversity, more food. It's, it's just, uh, I think it's, it's, it's sort of a no brainer. Um, so a vertical monopile, uh, there has been studies uh, by uh, DTU, the Danish Technological University on the monopiles, you know, in, I can't give you the exact findings, but I wouldn't be surprised if you were completely right, that there would be less you know, the, the biofouling would slough off more, more actively, more, more readily uh, on a shorter time scale, and there might be a lot less of it. Uh, and it's gonna be interesting to see how much, how many of those, the, those developments up and down the East Coast are gonna rely on monopiles versus jacketed structures. Uh, what, I think what you're finding now is even in what would people would call a little more quiescent, you know, ocean areas, uh, people are moving towards jacketed structures. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But 
you know, Greg, you're, you're, you're on to something. And I think that there's, there's going to be an additional science needed, you know, on how the monopiles and this biodiversity nexus plays out. Thanks, Greg. And that's Greg Vespi from the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association. Um, Dave Monty. Hi, uh, nice uh, presentation, Barry. My name is Dave Monty. I'm a charter captain uh, here in Rhode Island, fish the Block Island wind farm often. Um, there's this great uh, controversy um, between wild harvest and agriculture um, uh, fisheries. There's also, you know, conflicts between, as we all know, uh, fishing and offshore wind in general. There's all of the jurisdictional um, uh, challenges that you so appropriately mentioned, st various states where wind farms are being developed. And it seems that uh, in, in all of these interest groups, interest groups, commercial fishers, recreational fishermen, uh, the aquaculture industry, the offshore wind industry, all have rights to the, to the ocean because it truly belongs to the people of the United States of America. So, but how, do, how does one uh, coordinate uh, the research? How does one, and, I, and I'd like you to, to address this. You had mentioned that the UK, um, you know, uh, the Crown wanted offshore wind. So they're, so we're gonna have offshore wind. It's, it's different here. I know recently BOEM asked the Academy of Sciences here to be a neutral party with offshore wind science. Folks have mentioned perhaps NOAA should take on more of that role. Knowing both European models and US models, what are your thoughts in this area in terms of how to, how to move this forward? Yeah, you, you know, David, you just mentioned the kind of complexity that we're dealing with. And uh, Carolyn pointed out, you know, that these are the resources that everybody owns. Um, there has, the, I think individual states might be like individual European countries in this, this, this way, that some states might not allow, you know, the kinds of multi, uh, multiple uh, sort of ventures that you just mentioned to access uh, the wind power companies and other ones, I mean, I think the political pressure could be exerted to, uh, on, on a state level now, to allow multiple use. Now, let's just, you know, dial it back from, from you know, kind of the most intensive uses, again, which I consider to be, you know, proposals that for, you know, large-scale fin fish culture and all of those feeds and other logistics you know, I, I, I want to start, you know, basically with, with people like you, David. And so, you know, what is, how can multiple users uh, earning uh, good livelihoods be accommodated in a stepwise fashion, you know, within the wind power areas? Let me just give you an example in Copenhagen that you might have heard about. Uh, there was a massive amount of opposition from the riparian, from the, the, the communities around that area to the development of those wind towers. Um, and to the point where uh, they weren't going to happen, they finally happened to you know, more of a, of a directed socialist type government. They said the government said it's gonna happen, so it happened. Uh, and then about sort of six years later, and I'm hearing that David, maybe this is happening in, in Block Island, you know, it became a major tourist attraction. And some of the tourism companies, uh, you know, they switched uh, to, not only bringing out you know recreational fishers, they they brought the you know the the Airbnb kind of people out. You know they it became like an Airbnb top experience. You know um, which by the way Airbnb now has these these experiences because that's the way tourism is evolving. They just don't you know you want to get it. They want to have an experience. So I mean that's a that's additional users. That's additional revenue. That's additional families being supported. That's building diverse and, and local communities. So, you know, just the, the issues about step-by-step step tourism, you know, and looking how that can work out. And then, you know, how we can enhance, you know, fishing in that area or accommodate fishing, uh, which is, could be initially, you know, recreational fishing and, you know, with good applied science along with that. Because as as, De as uh, Greg mentioned, I mean, there's these, if these are gonna be monopiles, it's gonna be different than jackets. And you might have a, you know, a recreational fishing initiative. 
Uh, and then when you start getting into aquaculture, it's engaging the, well, by the way, back to fishing. I mean, one of the wonderful things in Rhode Island and more jurisdictions needs this, you know, you have the Rhode Island Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, you know, that can be receiving these funds to constantly be doing applied research and interacting with the other parts of the, of the structures uh, and par partners in Rhode Island. But then when you start getting into sort of, you know, mussels and oysters and shellfish, you have tremendous expertise locally and in New England, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic on, on the best ways forward. And again, it's another learning community. Um, people have experience on growing these organisms in exposed conditions. So we don't really sort of need a lot of new science there. We need some technology transfer and engagement with these people uh, and, and listening, big, listening with big ears. Those kinds of skills that uh, people like Jen McCann have spent, uh, you know, as an outstanding leader, have spent a career doing. Hopefully that was a little bit helpful. I always like to make a, a, a speech about everything. I should just answer the question. Um, Bob, Bob Rowe, do you want to get, you had an opinion? Yeah, wanna... Barry, um, <clears throat> we just don't see much evidence in Europe of any multi-use. The wind farms seem to have not been willing to discuss anything with aquaculturists or fishermen. They just, um, they don't want us anywhere out there. And I don't see much evidence um, that the wind farm developers in the U.S. are willing to have real conversations with industry, uh, just a fair amount of lip service. How do we get them to engage in an honest fashion and think about actually doing this? Well, we're, uh, we might debate a little bit about, you know, particularly Germany and the Netherlands. We might debate about that, about, uh, you know, how that's progressing because of the pressure from you know, other user groups to be out there and, and you know, reversing maybe some decisions that were made earlier. So I think multi-use is going to happen in many places fairly quickly in Europe, but um, I hear you loud and clear. How do you get the, you know, the Orsteds and the other, you know, wind companies um, to effectively engage? I go back to like, you know, if, if anything, you know, the jurisdiction that you're in, you know, Rhode Island and, and you know, your group, the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association, um, you know, we you need to set the table properly. And so where the table is not set and, you know, there is exclusion, um, you know, you go backwards. You keep on going backwards and then you know, all of a sudden you realize as you've gone down the, that way that you should have set the table properly. So I think that discussion needs to go on. You know, who... Who really needs to be at the table to get enhanced fisheries in that area if it's going to be allowed? So that's you know a, a governmental decision or or a public decision. Um, and I'm talking at the state level now. Um, yeah, and uh, exclusion, well, for example, there. exclusion of the fishing community is is yeah. is going is a is a is a fatal flaw. I think, you know, I think Rob and I know Bill Silks probably have talked to the developers. So who else do you think should be at the table? Can you give them advice? Well, sure. I mean, um, you know, producer, the producer community is only one part of the value chain because uh, the producers need to earn money. And so the uh, producers sell to, you know, buyers and, and markets. So some of the, you know, we, we need to actually plan for value chains, value chain strategic planning. When we talk about any, you know, new marine products, uh, this is all the rage right now in some of the, you know, the fisheries policy and aquaculture policy uh, people in talking about, you know, planning and investing in value chains. So I think, you know, some of the, the buyers and the retailers, some of those, you know, major ones that are going to buy people's products or going to take tourists out and, you know, get incomes from just not only their fees to get on the boat, uh, you know, they need to be involved. Thank you. Um, Sereno, and then Judy, and then Nicole. 
So, hi everyone. My name is Hernando Didrikson. I'm a researcher in blue economy in Brazil. And uh, my question is pretty close to Bob. And it's mostly if, if, if this uh, issue of setting the table and what is what do you see the articulation uh, between the, the science that, that we need, right? If, if the science, if this transdisciplinary science could have a big role in, in not setting the table, but like um, doing this uh, knowledge, right? Um, knowledge research and all the stakeholders, what could be other um, benefits from the economy that we, we usually don't see it. Thank you. You know, Serena, one of the things, you know, reflecting on, uh, you know, the wind towers off of Block Island, how they actually got in the water uh, for America's first offshore wind farm. You know, one of the things that was really striking to me is that the table was pretty well set. Uh, in other words, government didn't control the process. Government just had another seat at the table along with, uh, you know, a facilitator, a extension group, you know, well-experienced extension group, uh, and with a university. Um, where government, um, you know, government can make things happen, but also it can, it can, can mess things up. I mean, as in terms of having a neutral facilitated process that is, you know, well-described uh, where government is just got a seat at the table. They don't control everything. So, um, you know, that was, I think, one of the keys to the success of getting the America's first offshore wind farm, you know, in Rhode Island. Thank you. Judy? Yeah, hi. Um, I was really interested in the, um, the slides on the uh, offshore charging stations for various kinds of vessels. And um, just a couple of questions. What, one of the main concerns I hear from our Connecticut-based fishermen here is the is um, the difficulty of uh, transiting through the wind farms to get to their favorite fishing grounds and the you know the one mile versus two mile uh, space you know spacing between them and whatnot. So I'm curious how that would work with uh, charging ports that might be available. And the other question, the related question, I'm wondering, does this exist anywhere? And I also see a, a huge potential for this, a very exciting potential with the recreational boating community. So I'm wondering if that's being um, looked at as well. I mean, the price of fuel is just, you know, <laughs> you know, people are just, you know, really, you know, really being hit hard by it. And it, it would be such a, a, I think, such a boost to the recreational fishing or uh, uh, recreational boating boaters. Yeah, is that this, available? What, what is interesting, um, this is not a new discussion within the wind power companies. They've always, they're always looking at ways of earning additional income. So the offshore grid um, has advanced substantially uh, in the last two years. I think it's still got to go for safety reasons. It's still got to go a little bit further, but we're going to see it happen. So uh, even uh, the last meeting we had at URI, uh, the Orsted people pointed out that you know this is they're, they're working on this internationally in many uh, locations. So the offshore grid will happen now. <laughs> Obviously, they've sold the cables to shore and to substations, and that's going to still be the you know, major income source is to sell it to users, you know, here on land. Um, okay, so with that said, um, I would pay attention if, if you even just do a Google after this, Judy, and you'll, you know, the offshore grid, you will see, you know, research projects all over the world now that they are going to turn into a commercial. Uh, you might even see one of the first ones there in Rhode Island, you know, as, as, a, as a pilot scale. Now, uh, yes, logistics within the towers and safety. And then, then you start getting into safety people, you know, and they are, you know, they've got, you know, flashes and beacons and, you know, radar. I mean, there's all kinds of things, both on the boats as well as on the towers that are trying to improve safety, not only for, you know, people going in if they, uh, or users going in, but also for the workers. You know, worker safety is, is, is just everything when you're talking about offshore operations. 
So there, there is a massive investment in that, but it's mostly right now from the worker safety. People are actually going to be constructing and you know, managing and maintaining and cleaning, et cetera, the towers. Um, so I, I think that that is still out there. That's a portfolio which is still developing. But it all, again, it all pretty much exists in other sectors of the economy, you know, safety uh, innovations. Um, and vessel safety and, and, and structural safety issues. Some of the issues about you know, slamming into, it's really not that different than you know, slamming into the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, uh, really, I mean, uh, it, the, when you think about it, you know, the, the kinds of maneuvers and safety uh, that, is, 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 that goes on for vessels that are you know, tight squeezes during rough conditions to get into our ports right now, um, there is tremendous computer and other innovations. So I, I, I think it all be done needs to be invested in. Great, thank you. Thank you, Barry. Judy is with Connecticut Sea Grant. Great oh, to sorry. see you. Yeah. And um, Nicole Verdi is one of those Orsted people, Barry, you keep talking about. So or, Nicole, great to see you. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a really wonderful discussion. And I just, Barry, I don't necessarily have a question, but I just wanted to say kind of a few things. Um, one, we're happy to be a part of this conversation. We've been a part of all of the in-person conversations that Jen and her amazing team have put together. And we want to continue to be involved to, to dive through some of the issues that have been discussed. Um, and then I will also say, you know, if there are folks when you talk about safety and navigating through the wind farms. Um, we actually have a simulator in Portsmouth, Rhode Island that for someone who gets um, motion sickness out on the water, sometimes I get motion sickness in the simulator. It's that um, impressive. And so that sometimes is helpful in seeing what it is like to navigate around the wind farm with the one by one nautical mile. So if there are folks that are interested um, I can connect them with members of my team to make sure that they have an opportunity to go out on the simulator and see what that is like. And then the other thing that I will say is we really are working hard um, in Europe and in the United States to try to see where multi-use is possible and how we can do it in an efficient and an effective way. And there are there are folks that you probably met in person last week, um, Jonathan, or sorry, not last week, at the last meeting, Jonathan and Anthony who have been working on this um, and are happy to talk to folks at any time and be a part of what conversations are needed to move the ball forward. I will tell you one thing that I have heard is sometimes there's actually a conflict between aquaculture use and fishing use. And so that is something trying to make sure that we're being mindful of all of the multi-use with and around our wind farms is something that we're, we're navigating um, and we're, we're trying to do the best that we can. But I just appreciate this conversation. I am here. Uh, if folks want to reach out to me afterwards, I will put my email in the chat if that's helpful and can connect. I work, I lead the government affairs and policy for New England, but there are folks that specify on our experts in all of the different um, subjects that were mentioned that I'm happy to connect um, folks to as well. So want to be as helpful as possible. Barry, thank you so much for this presentation. Jen, thank you for getting this together uh, and looking forward to, to future discussions as well. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Our team did the simulator the other um, few weeks ago and uh, agree with you. It was a little a little seasickness happened, but it was all good. Um, but it was a great experience. And um, let us know if we can um, help facilitate any of those conversations as well. Um, thank you, Nicole, for reaching out. Appreciate it. Um, the, so Dave Everett asked a question. He cannot ask the question um, verbally. Uh, he's in a location where he, I guess he can't talk, but it goes back to the, um, I'm going to do my best, Barry. The the, the point Dave was mentioning, it, it, it focuses on the urban ports, you know, and the adjacent enhancement as energy and ports get cleaner and sees potentially more bountiful. You know, how can planning and policy ensure that local, poor, more degraded communities with their current positive connections to the sea benefit from wind and multi-use in addition to cleaner power? So how do we, how do we get encourage the, or how do we um, add value? How does multi-use add value to those diverse communities, and specifically around ports? 
the, this is an overgeneralization. So take it for what it's worth. Uh, my experience in you know, sort of growing up near a port community um, is that in many cases, uh, these are the most disadvantaged um, that need you know, adequate housing and they need you know, really good jobs. Um, I think that, for example, um, universities, and I can give you one example, direct example, uh, you know, the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, I think, has done a, a very good job in opening up, you know, an innovation center uh, focused on a lot of what we're talking about, you know, in the quite disadvantaged communities that I come from, you know, the Azorean Portuguese communities of southeastern Massachusetts, uh, and particularly the port of New Bedford. I would venture to say that some, if you go throughout the United States in your mind, when you visit the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach or Houston, you will see a similar situation. Um, those people are hungry for the kinds of jobs, particularly manufacturing and other in, you know, intellectual jobs right up through manufacturing that we're talking about that wind power could provide. I am absolutely pleased to hear uh, during some of our meetings, Jen, uh, at URI, uh, that Orsted had an initiative to actually, you know, emphasize this type of employment around, you know, its 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 manufacturing operations. Um, I don't think they're alone. I mean, this is also going on in other communities. Um, yeah, uh, it is uh, really it's a measure of, you know, sort of land based spatial planning uh, and, you know, community development. I mean, these uh, the kinds of efforts like you've got going on at URI, Jen, um, need to be ex expanded, you know, internationally to so that we can see port communities uh, worldwide become, you know, more diverse and, and uh, you know, local communities be developed. Right. Uh, you know, the, it's job creation. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we, when, 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 when power companies start advertising for, you know, sort of major, you know, job initiatives that produce good income, it's going to get, you know, local community uh, mayors, et cetera, um, selectmen, et cetera, women, uh, uh, it's going to get their attention. So, Great. but, you know, here's just one comment too, is that um, the, the kinds of political jurisdictions in the U.S., it's almost like there's a, there are, there are borders between the states. And they got probably even more strong during COVID, the borders. Um, there's got to be some strategic initiatives to partnership between the different ports, like, for example, Port Judith and, Point Judith and, and, and New Bedford. You know, that would be kind of a no brainer. I'm sure it's going on, but maybe not uh, at the level that it needs to be in order to create, you know, the, what we're talking about. Great, thank you. And I will, I know Dave can't speak for himself, but I, if, if anyone else is in um, uh, this, it's the port community, uh, I would call it a community of practice. Dave, I'm not sure what you would call it, um, but it's a group of, of individuals uh, around the ports, um, in, primarily in Providence, um, and at, you know, um, state agencies, um, federal agencies, including EPA, um, local community organizations, and the port, um, among others. Many, many people meet regularly. Dave facilitates this effort with other, I believe, other state entities and, and EPA to create that learning experience and to provide this group with information and access to these sort of conversations. So um, it's it's quite a, a, a effective um, initiative, which I think we should um, engage more. So um, that's a great example of providing those the, the communities with access for information and, and decision making. Um, Abby Green from our team also just um, put in a couple um, some information. Um, about, um, as many of you know, um, in Rhode Island, there's, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about um, offshore wind energy cable laying and um, in the Sakonet River. And so our team has been invited by the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association and the town of Portsmouth to provide 
objective um, information about um, about this topic. And so, um, Abby is uh, with with the groups I mentioned. There will be an event um, this Thursday. Um, it's a virtual event. Actually, Abby, why don't you say it? Sure, yeah. Um, the event is on Thursday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Common Fence Point Community Center. It's held in person, but there is a virtual option if you want to listen and watch online. Um, you can also text in your questions. So if people in the room, if we somehow run out of questions from people who come to the meeting uh, in person, we will be turning to the ones that are coming in online. Um, this coming event is going to focus on where community members and anyone who's interested in participating in the permitting process and informing the decision making um, of the regulators that are within our state and municipal entities, um, we can identify where you can engage in the process. Um, so we'll have CRMC, the Energy Facility Siting Board, Save the Bay, um, and Leah Hitchin, who is the town planner for Portsmouth, all will be speaking about these processes. So please come and spread the word. And um, Dave, can you tell, um, can you add, if people want to know more about your working group, how do we um, find out more about that? Should we contact you directly? And, and if so, um, you could give us your email or your personal cell phone, we'll all call you. Okay, so um, if you want to put that in the chat, that would be great too. Um, any last minute, one last question for Barry? Barry, I, I have a question. You know, you're heading over to to Norway, right? Yes. What are you going to be doing there? There's a big discussion about uh, you know sort of the future future of food production um, <laughs> is been said to have offshore, <laughs> moving you know the the particularly the salmon you know offshore. Indeed, what's been happening is that almost all of the developments are quite near shore. Uh, there's really sort of no big, you know, news about sort of moving into the open ocean. Uh, the whole discussion, you know, globally, uh, including Norway, is energetic oceans. Energetic oceans, can we, can we produce more food near shore in energetic oceans? And that all of a sudden, now you're talking about energy structures, you know, tidal, uh, wind, and so uh, that's what, the, what we're embroiled in. And also, of course, I, I need to emphasize, you know, the next generation. My 25 students come from 10 different countries, including the U.S. So uh, it's that, you know, enhancing the global to local so that uh, it's technology transfer in, in, in many different ways, not sort of having to create a lot of new. We know a lot. Right. Didn't you always say global? <laughs> well, maybe, Wasn't that you that said maybe that? Maybe I tried to invent the word. I don't think it caught on, Jen. Okay. <laughs> well, um, you know, again, um, Barry, we really appreciate all your insight, your thoughts. I know, you know, we know you've been thinking about this a lot. And, you know, while we haven't solved the multi-use topic, the issue, you know, as you said, you know, in, in my opinion, the big one of the biggest challenges is the regulatory aspect. And you said. I don't really have any answers for that. And, and again, yeah. maybe there are answers and we need to you know, figure that out. And again, we have Julia Wyman here and Emily um, here as well, who, uh, who do provide technical legal expertise. Maybe we need to lean on them to help us with this too. But um, it's a process. And um, you know, again, our team is open to um, creating that place for people to have these difficult conversations and hopefully we can begin to implement early action so we can see some, um, some, you know, some, some tangible results as we move yeah. forward. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, this event was recorded and so we will be sharing the recording as well as Barry's um, PowerPoint, um, we'll probably connect it to our website so you can share that with others. Um, and again, please contact us if you have any questions or you would like to um, continue and, and join our conversation.
have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Please feel free to contact Thanks, me if you if you if there's any way I can help. Thank you.